Hey, welcome back everyone. Day three of AWS reInvent 2022. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante, co-host of theCUBE. Dave, 10 years for us, the leader in high tech coverage is our slogan now. 10 years of reInvent Day. We've been to every single one except for the original, which we would have come to if Amazon actually marketed the event, but they didn't. It's more of a customer <coughs> event. This is day three, it's the uh, machine learning, AI keynote, Swami's up there. Um, a lot of announcements, we're going to break this down. We got, uh, we got Andy Thurai here, Vice President of Principal Analysts of Constellation Research. Andy, great to see you, you've been on theCUBE before, one of our analysts. Uh, bring in, the, bring in the, uh, the analysis commentary to the keynote, this is your wheelhouse AI. What do you think about Swami up there? Yeah. I mean, he's awesome, we love him, big fan oh, yeah. of, of theCUBE and we're fans of him. But he got 13 announcements. A lot, a, a lot. lot. So, well, some of them are, first of all, thanks for having me here. Um, and I'm glad to have both of you on the same show attacking me, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but um, some of the announcements really uh, sort of like a game changer announcements, and some of them are like meh, you know, just to plug in the holes what they have. And then a lot of golf claps in the yeah, right. meeting today. Yeah. And you could have also noticed that by when he was making the announcements, you know, the, <laughs> the, the clapping volume difference, you could say, which is better, right? Yeah. But uh, some of the announcements are, are really, really good. Um, you know, particularly we talked about one of that was, um, Microsoft took the route of you know having the open AI in there doing the large language models and then they were going after that you know having the transformer available to them and Amazon was a little bit weak in that area so they couldn't they don't have a large language model so you know they, they are taking a different route saying that you know what I'll help you train the large language model by yourself customized models so I can provide the necessary instance I can provide the instant volume memory the whole name yeah so you can train the model by yourself without depending on them kind of thing so Dave and Andy I want to get your thoughts um, because first of all, we've been following Amazon's deep bench on the, on the infrastructure pass. They've been doing a lot of machine learning and AI, a lot of data. <clears throat> it just seems that the sentiment is, is that there's other competitors doing a good job too, like Google, Dave, and I've heard folks in the hallway, even here, ex-Amazonians saying, hey, they're training their models on Google, then they bring them to SageMaker, because it's a better interface. So you got Google making a play for being that data cloud. Microsoft's obviously putting in a, a great kind of package to kind of make it turnkey. How do they really stand versus the competition guys? Good question. So they, you know, each have their own uniqueness and the variation that take it to the field, right? So for example, if you were to look at it, Microsoft is known for its industry um, related things that they have been going after, you know, industry verticals and whatnot. So that's one of the things I looked here, you know, they, they had this omics announcement, particularly towards that uh, healthcare genomics space. That's a huge space for HPC uh, related AI ML applications. And they have put a lot of things in together in here in the SageMaker and in the in their models, saying that you know how do you how do you use this transformative to do things like that, like for example drug discovery, for genomics analysis, for cancer treatment, the whole nine yards, right? That's a huge volumes of data though. So they're going in that healthcare area. Google has taken a different route. I mean, they want to make everything simple. All I have to do is that I got to call an API, give what I need, and then get it done. But Amazon wants to go at a much deeper level, saying that, you know what, I want to provide everything you need. You can customize the whole thing for what you need. So, yes. to, so to me, <clears throat> the big picture here is, and, and Swami references, hey, we're a data company, we started, he talked about books, and how that informed them as to you know, what books to place front and center. Here's the, here's the big picture, in my view. Companies need to put data at the core of their business, mm -hmm. and they haven't, they've generally, put humans at the core of their business, and data and now machine learning are at the, at the outside, in the periphery. Amazon, Google, Microsoft, Facebook have put data at their core. So the question is, how do incumbent companies, and he mentioned some, Toyota, Capital One, Bristol Myers Squibb, I don't know, are those data companies, you know, we'll see. But the challenge is, most companies don't have the resources, as you well know, Andy, to actually implement what Google and Facebook and others have. So, how are they going to do that? Well, they're going to buy it, right? So, are they going to build it with tools? That's kind of like you said, the Amazon approach. Or are they going to buy it from Microsoft and, and, and Google? I, I pulled some ETR data to say, okay, who are the top companies that are showing up in terms of spending? Mm. Who's spending with whom? AWS number one, Microsoft number two, Google number three, Databricks number four, just in terms of you know, presence. And then it falls down. Data Robot, Anaconda, Data IQ, Oracle popped up, actually, because they're embedding a lot of AI into their products, and, and of course IBM. And then a lot of smaller companies. But do companies generally, customers, have the resources to do what it takes to implement AI into applications and into workflows? 
a couple of things on that. One is, uh, when it comes down to, I mean, it's it's no surprise that the the top three are the hyperscalers because they all want to bring their business to them to run the specific workloads. And the next biggest workload, as he was saying in his keynote, are two things. One is the AI ML workloads. The other one is the the heavy unstructured workloads that he was talking about, 80%, 90% of the data that's coming off is unstructured. So how do you analyze it? Such as the geospatial data he was talking about, the volumes of data you need to analyze, the, the neural, deep neural network you ought to use. Only hyperscalers can do it, right? So that's no wonder all of them on top. Um, for the data, one of the things they announced, which uh, not many people paid attention, there was a zero ATL that, that they talked about. What that does is a little bit of a game-changing moment in a sense that you don't have to, for example, if you have to train the data, if the data is distributed everywhere, if you have to bring them all together to integrate it to do that, it's a lot of work to doing the DTL. So by taking Amazon Aurora and then Redshift, combine them as a zero or no ETL, and then have Apache, uh, Apache Spark applications run on top of analytical applications, ML workloads, that's huge. So you don't have to move around the data. Use the data where it is. I, I think you said it. They're basically filling holes, right? They created yeah. this, you know, suite of tools. Let's call it. <laughs> you may say it's a mess. It's not a mess because it's they're really powerful, but they're not well integrated. And now they're starting to take well, the seams, as I say. Well, yeah, that's a great point. And I would double down and say, look at. I think that boring is good. You know, we had that phase in Kubernetes yeah. hype cycle where it got boring, and that was kind of like boring is good. Boring means we're getting better. We're invisible. That's infrastructure, that's in the weeds, that's in between the toes, details, it's the stuff that you know, people, we have to get done. So you, know, you look at their uh, 40 new data sources with Data Wrangler, 50 new app flow connectors, mm -hmm. Redshift Autocog, this is boring, good, important shit, Dave. The it's governance like, stuff. You, got, you got to get it, and, and the, the governance, governance yeah, is going to be yeah. key. So, so to me, this may not jump off the page. Adam's keynote also felt a little bit of, we got to get these gaps done in a good way. So I think that's a very positive sign. Now going back to the bigger picture, I think the real question is, can there be another independent cloud, data cloud? And that's, the, to me, what I try to get at my story, and your breaking analysis kind of hit a home run on this, is there's interesting opportunity for an independent data cloud. Mm -hmm. Meaning, something that isn't AWS, that isn't Google, isn't one of the big three, that could sit on its own. Let me give you an example. I had a conversation last night with a bunch of ex-Amazonian engineering teams that left. The conversation was interesting, Dave. They were like talking, well, Databricks and Snowflake are basically batch, okay, not transactional. And you look at Aerospike, I can see their booth here. Transactional data bases are hot right now. Streaming data is different. Confluence different than Databricks. Is Databricks good at hosting? No, Amazon's better. So you start to see these kinds of questions come up where you know, Databricks is great, but maybe not good for this, that, and the other thing. So you start to see the formation of swim lanes or visibility into where people might sit in the ecosystem, but what came out was transactional yep. and batch, the relationship there, and streaming real time and versus you know, the transactional data. So you start to see these new things emerge. Andy, what do you, what's your take on this? You're following this closely. This seems to be the alpha nerd conversation, and it all points to who's going to have the best data cloud. Say data super clouds, I call it. But what's your take? Uh, yes, data cloud is important as well, but also the computational that goes on top of it too, right? Because when, when the data is like unstructured data, it's that much of a huge data, it's going to be hard to do that with a low amount of you know, uh, compute power. But going back to your data point, um, the training of the AI ML models required the batch data, right? That's when you need all the, the historical data to train your models. And then after that, when you do inference of it, that's where you need the streaming real-time data that's available to you until you can make an inference. One of the things what, what they also announced, which is somewhat interesting, is um, you, you saw that they have like 700 different instances geared towards every single workload. And right. there are some of them very specifically run on the Amazon's new chip, the, the inference INF2 and the uh, Tranium TR1 chips. That basically, not only has a specific instances, but also it's run on a high power chip. And then if you have the data to support that, both the training as well as towards the inference, the efficiency, again, those numbers have to be proven. They claim that it could be anywhere between 40 to 60% faster. Well, so, a couple things. You're definitely right. I mean, Snowflake started out as a data warehouse that was simpler, and it's not architected you know, in, a, in its first wave to do real-time inference, which is not. <clears throat> now, how, how could they, uh, the other second point is, 
Snowflake's two or three years ahead when it comes to governance, data sharing. I mean, Amazon's doing what it always does. It's copying, you know, it's customer driven because they probably walk into an account and they say, hey, look what Snowflake's doing for us. This stuff's kicking ass. And they go, oh, that's a good idea. Let's do that too. You saw that with separating compute from storage, which is their tiering. You saw it today with <coughs> extending data sharing, Redshift data sharing. So, how does Snowflake <coughs> and Databricks approach this? They do it with ecosystem. They bring in ecosystem partners, they bring in open source tooling, and that's how they compete. I think there's unquestionably an opportunity for a data cloud. Yeah, My and I think, I think the super cloud conversation and then you know, Sky Cloud with Berkeley uh, Paper and other folks talking about this kind of pre-multi-cloud era. I mean, that's what I would call us right now. We are, we're kind of in the pre-era of multi-cloud, which by the way is not even yet defined. I think people use that term, Dave, to say, you know, oh, some sort of magical thing that's happening. Yeah, people have multiple clouds. They, got, they, they end up by default, not by design, as uh, Dell likes right. to say. And they got to deal with it. So it's more of they're inheriting multiple cloud environments. It's not necessarily what they want in the situation. So to me, that is a big, big issue. Yeah, I mean, again, going back to your uh, um, Snowflake and Databricks announcements, they're a data company. So they, that's how they made their mark in the market, saying that, you know, I do all these things, therefore you have, I had to have your data, because it's a seamless data. And, and Amazon is catching up with that, with a lot of their announcements they made. How far it's going to get traction, you know, to change, one has to see. Yeah, I mean, to me, to me, there's no doubt about it, Dave. I think, I think what Swami's doing, if Amazon can get, corner the market on, out of the box, ML, and AI capabilities so that people can make it easier, that's going to be the end of the day a tell sign. Can they fill in the gaps? Again, boring is good. Competition, I don't know. I mean, I'm not following the competition, Andy. This is a real question mark for me. I don't know where they stand. Are they more comprehensive? Are they more deeper? Are they have deeper services? I mean, obviously, it shows all the, the different you know, capabilities. Um, where, where, where does Amazon stand? What's the process? So, what, particularly when it comes to the models, so they're going at, at a different angle that, you know, I will help you create the models. We talked about right. the zero ATL and the whole data. We'll get the data sources in, we'll create the model, we'll move the, the whole model. We're talking about the MLOps themes here, right? And they have the whole functionality that, that they built and that they've matured over the years. So essentially they want to become the platform that I, when you come in, I'm the only platform you would use from the model training to deployment to inference to model versioning to management, the whole nine years. And that's the angle they're trying to take. So it's as a one source platform. What about this idea of technical debt? Adrian Cockroft was on yesterday, John. I know you talked to him as well. He said, look, Amazon's Legos. You want to buy a toy for Christmas, you can go out and buy a toy. Or do you want to build a toy? If you buy a toy in a couple years, it could break. And what are you going to do? You're going to throw it out. But if, you, if, you, if part of your Lego needs to be extended, you extend it. So, you know, George Gilbert was saying, well, there's a lot of technical debt. Adrian was countering that. Does no. Amazon have technical debt or is that Lego blocks analogy the right one. Well, I talked to him about the debt, and one of the things we talked about was, what do you optimize for, EC2 APIs or Kubernetes APIs? It depends on what team you're on. If you're on the runtime team, you're going to optimize for uh, Kubernetes, but EC2 is the resources you want to use. So, I think the idea of the 15 years of technical debt, I, I don't believe that, I think the APIs are still hardened. The issue that he brings up that I think is relevant is, it's an and situation, not an or. You can have the, the bag of Legos, which is the primitives, and build a durable application platform monitor it, customize it, work with it, build it. It's harder, but the outcome is durability and sustainability. Building a toy, having a toy with those Legos glued together for you, you can get to play with, but it'll break over time, then you got to replace it. So there's going to be a toy business, and there's going to be a Legos business, make your own. So who, who are the toys in AI? Well, out of the box. And, and, who, and, you know, who's and out who are the, the Legos? Uh, the, so you're asking about what, uh, what yeah, toys if, Amazon building? Yeah, or? I mean, Amazon clearly is Lego blocks. If people are going to have out of the box solutions, what, 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 what about Google? What about Microsoft? Are they basically more, more building toys, more solutions? So Google is more of you know, building solutions angle, like you know, I give you an API kind of thing. But, but if it comes to vertical industry solutions, Microsoft is, is, is ahead, right? Because they have, they have had years of inter, in the industry experience. I mean, there are other smaller clouds that are trying to do that too, IBM being an example. But you know, the, now they are starting to go after the specific industry use cases. They think that through. For example, you know, the medical one we talked about, right? So they want to build the, the health uh, lake, security health lake that they're trying to build, which will HIPAA compliant, and it'll provide all the, the European regulations, the whole nine yards, and it'll help you 
um, you know, personalized things as you need as well. For example, you know, if you go for a certain treatment, it could analyze you based on your genome profile, saying that you know, the treatment for this particular person has to be individualized this way. But doing that requires enormous power, right? So if you do applications like that, you could bring in a lot of this, whether healthcare, finance, or what have you, and then it'd be <coughs> easy for them to use. What's the biggest mistake customers make when it comes to machine intelligence, AI, machine learning? <laughs> so many things, right? I could start out with even the, the model, basically when you build a model, you, you should be able to figure out how long that model is effective, because as good as creating a model and, and going to the business and doing things the right way, there are people that they leave the model much longer than it's needed, it's hurting your business more than it is. You know, it could be things like that. Or you're, you're not building a responsible AI related things, you're, you're having a bias in your model, there are so many issues. I, I don't know if I can pinpoint one, but there are many, many issues. Responsible AI, ethical AI. You know? All right. Well, we'll leave it there. You're watching theCUBE, the leader in high-tech coverage. Here at J3 at reInvent, I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante, with Andy joining us here for the critical analysis and breaking down the commentary. We'll be right back with more coverage after this short break.